According to the United Nations, the Earth is now about 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than it was in the late 1800s, making it the hottest it has been in 100,000 years. The decade between 2011 to 2020 was the warmest on record, with each of the past four decades being hotter than any day before since 1850. Today, we discuss the impact of this warming and the urgent need for action on climate change. Welcome to HUD Hour, the flagship program of HUD Network, where we analyze and discuss contemporary issues within the humanitarian and development space. I am Amadine Ogbewe. And I am Joan Eze. You welcome to the program. Adapting to the consequences of climate change is essential to protect our people, homes, businesses, livelihoods, infrastructure, and natural ecosystems. Today, we'll focus on climate change and its profound impact on affected communities. We'll explore the latest research and strategies for mitigating its effects uh, through stories from around the globe will highlight the varying conditions and challenges faced in different regions. But first, here's a look at our headlines for the day. Africa faces rising climate change cost, WMO report reveals. Malaysia unveils updated climate change policy. Nepal faces devastating flood aftermath. Those are our headlines and we'll take them after the break and after we give you a background. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. Climate change involves long-term changes in temperature and weather patterns. While natural factors like volcanic eruptions and solar activity can influence the climate, human activities have been the primary cause since the 1800s, mainly due to burning fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas, which release greenhouse gases that trap heat in the earth and raises temperature. Due to the interconnectivity of the earth, the consequences of climate change have evolved to now include, among others, intensive droughts, water scarcity, severe fires, rising sea levels, flooding, melting polar ice, catastrophic storms, and declining biodiversity. Well, uh, rising sea levels and saltwater intrusion are forcing entire communities to move, while ongoing droughts are putting people at risk of famine in the future, more people are expected to be displaced by weather-related events. Climate change emissions come from all over the world and impact everyone, but some countries produce much more than others. According to the United Nations, the seven largest emitters in 2020 were China, the United States, India, the European Union, Indonesia, Russia, and Brazil. These countries were responsible for about half of global greenhouse gas emissions. The 100 least emitting countries generate 3% of total greenhouse emissions. The 10 largest emitters contribute 68%. While everyone needs to take action, those contributing more to the problem have a greater responsibility to lead the way. And the United Nations projects that transitioning to a green economy could generate $26 trillion in economic benefits by 2030, compared to continuing current practices. This shift could also create over 65 million new low-carbon jobs. And on the other hand, the World Meteorological Organization says that to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, investments in renewable energy must triple by 2050 and clean energy electricity supply must double within the next eight years. This requires approximately $4 trillion annually in renewable energy investments by 2030, including technology and infrastructure. Clearly, urgent action is required to save the Earth from a global climate crisis. We'll dive further into the updates on climate change and climate action and more solutions after a quick break. Don't go anywhere. As our news items, a new report from the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, reveals that Africa is facing severe challenges due to climate change. On average, African countries are losing between 2 to 5% of their GDP and are reallocating up to 9% of their budgets to deal with climate-related issues. 
the report estimates that the cost of adapting to climate change in sub-Saharan Africa could reach 30 to $50 billion annually over the next decade, which is about 2 to 3% of the region's GDP. Without adequate intervention, as many as 118 million people living in extreme poverty could be affected by severe weather events like droughts and floods by 2030. To combat these issues, the WMO stresses the need for more investment in national meteorological and hydrological services and a quick implementation of the early warnings for all initiatives. These actions are essential for reducing risk and supporting sustainable development. The WMO Secretary General, Celeste Saulo, highlighted that Africa has experienced significant warming over the last 60 years, with 2023 being the hottest year on record. The continent has faced deadly heat waves, floods, and prolonged droughts, especially in the Horn of Africa and southern regions. Well, um, as it says there, this is Africa in focus. Mm. Um, I think one of the issues that we'll probably discuss as the program goes along is the vulnerability of certain places and certain people so climate change and how these things affect them uh, disproportionately, uh, so to speak. And this just paints the picture of what Africa is facing and how Africa needs some level of um, intervention and urgent action, like we always say here, um, to tackle climate change. Because I, I think um, when we look at it, really, we have to you know, put ourselves in the shoes of those who are most affected. We, as journalists, we are the ones who put out the news. Sometimes we, we get to these uh, places and we see people going through all sorts of um, natural uh, issues, so to speak, uh, but due to unnatural influence that is causing climate action and, pardon me, climate change. So um, it's interesting to see how Africa is suffering this and we look to see what the solutions are and how we can begin to get out of this uh, mess we're in. Yeah, uh, that's a very, very good one, Amadine. The one that actually struck me so badly is the 2 to 3% that is being channeled of the GDP mm. that is channeled to um, this whole um, uh, natural disaster uh, kind of thing, climate change. It's not really, really funny uh, for countries, Africa as a continent, because instead of us to be channeling the money uh, for, you know, to move forward and to bring new innovations, we are trying to solve problems that could have been avoided. So for all this to reduce and to 2050, we the WMO is saying that we should now invest more into um, renewable energy so that we can have a cleaner access to energy and a cleaner environment as well. And of course, our economy can also boost instead of channeling money that is meant for something uh, good, we are trying to like repair what um, uh, a lot of things have damaged. For yeah. instance, the flooding, yeah. it's not really a very serious, it's a very, very serious uh, matter yeah. because with flooding, a lot of people are internally displaced. displaced. People yeah. are living where they're supposed to stay. Even wildlife and, is yeah, displaced. Yeah, wildlife, and it affects you that loves to eat meat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really, really that funny. All right, let's move to the next news item. Malaysia's Ministry of National Resources and Environmental Sustainability has launched the updated National Climate Change Policy 2.0, reaffirming its dedication to national climate goals and the upcoming Climate Change Act, expected in early 2025. The policy aims for a 45% reduction in carbon intensity by 2030, compared to 2005 levels and targeted net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. It will serve as a comprehensive framework for the country's transition to a low carbon economy, addressing governance, development, adaptation, climate financing, and international cooperation. Minister Nick Nzami Nick Ahmed announced that Malaysia will prioritize Article 6 of the Paris Agreement at the upcoming COP29 from November 11 to 22, highlighting the growing importance of emissions reduction through carbon market mechanisms in Southeast Asia. With Malaysia set to chair ASEAN in 2025, the minister emphasized the need for enhanced regional collaboration in climate efforts. All right, um, this is um, still the talk about 
curbing the whole greenhouse emissions and how it has or it is still affecting the climate change. And if um, actions are not taken, the global warming in, in quotes will continue to increase and of course it will lead to um, um, destruction in the lives of countries, in the world, in humans as well. And uh, I think what Malaysia is doing is trying to make sure that this is being reduced, even though not to the like total, um, not eradicated totally, but at least to a, a minimum, it should be reduced. Indeed, and you know, there are a lot of targets there. We saw 2050, we saw 2030, and all of that. And I think uh, this is part of discussions we've been having about fitting the framework or yeah. the solutions to the issues at hand and the geographical um, context. So when they say, you know what, we're going to use this time instead of perhaps the, the required or the globally accepted time, is based on their own projections. And we saw, you know, a lot of numbers, there were also 45% and all of that. So um, Malaysia, I believe, is, realizes that these things can be done without a proper plan. You can't just wing it yeah. you know, because, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the world is crumbling slowly, not to be uh, someone who is crying foul or crying alarm or raising the alarm, but there needs to be an, an alarm to be raised. And so when we see Malaysia taking it so seriously as to have policies, updating policies, you know, that's another issue here. They're trying to update a policy. It means that at some point you realize that happenings around the world have led to a need to evolve, to make this better, and you can't continue with an old plan. And I think that's what Malaysia is trying to do, to fit into the current times and also their own geographical context, their own situation and all of that. So as we always say on the program, we'll monitor it and see how it works and always come back here to report on the uh, benefits or how well it's working and how others can implement it. So for now, we'll take a break on our news items. Uh, we'll take, uh, when we return, we'll delve into our final news item. And after that, we'll be joined uh, virtually by a guest, an expert on the matter to do justice to the issue. Stay with us. Nepal is reeling from catastrophic floods that have claimed at least 246 lives, including 32 children, and displaced over 10,000 households, particularly in Kathmandu and nearby areas. The unprecedented rainfall on September 28 set records, causing rivers like the Sakoshi to overflow and triggering landslides. Rescue teams are still searching for missing individuals while communities work to clear debris and restore essential services, major highways remain disrupted, impacting recovery efforts. Initial damage assessments estimate cost at 13.4 billion rupees, approximately $100 million, with over 40 bridges destroyed and nearly 100 schools closed. Additionally, nearly 95,000 hectares of farmland were devastated, and 11 hydropower plants suffered severe damage raising concerns about the nation's energy infrastructure. Experts suggest this disaster could prompt investments in diversifying energy sources. Despite contributing only 0.1% to global greenhouse gas emissions, Nepal is highly vulnerable to climate change, with about 1.9 million citizens considered at significant risk. Many affected families in informal settlements along river banks are making them particularly susceptible to such disasters. But as you can see, Nepal seems to be uh, a more water-zoned region, and therefore uh, it's more likely to face climate change, uh, um, you know, disasters that relate to flooding and thereabouts. Um, interestingly, the assessment there, millions of dollars, and that's um, some of the things that we consider, like you said earlier, about trying to patch things up instead of finding sustainable solutions. And I think this is one of the things that um, uh, Nepal and other uh, countries are looking towards how to uh, do these things so that, um, you know, when they say penny wise, penny wise pound oh, foolish, where it seems as though you feel if it happens, we will respond. Mm. But then if you do things beforehand, you don't need to spend that much in your response. And in, again, I've, what we saw there is the people that were affected, just as in our earlier news item on the, from the report from the WMO. Yeah shows that Africa, it's you know, spending. you know, and yeah, and there are also really a lot of the victims who are getting from climate, um, act, climate change, pardon me, I keep missing up those words. Mm. So that being said, we also see that people who live up close to the river banks, uh, people who are in informal settlements, 
they are the ones most primed to suffer from these devastations. And I think that's one thing that should move all stakeholders to understand that possibly those who are sheltered, you know, those who are perhaps in the high class, although we'll get to that later, they also have their version and their own issues. Uh, it's these people who are more vulnerable, who need that help and who we need to be uh, helping out with climate action. Yeah, speaking of people that actually need this help, the vulnerables, you know, I, I, I saw like from the pictorial representation uh, on the screen, it's showing that the flooding that is happening currently or that has happened in Nepal mm -hmm. is a very, very serious um, uh, issue that has affected not just humans, uh, their shelter, their, their environment, and of course, their farmlands. And imagine when flooding like is affecting your, your farmland. Number one, there will be food scarcity. Mm. The economy is going down. Yeah. People don't have access to food, yeah. and the whole food insecurity is, is going down. Yeah. So a lot of things that climate change can cause. It causes more harm than, I don't know if there's any, yeah, there's no there's, good. There's, it's yeah. <laughs> there's actually no good. Yeah. So I think, or oh, I know that if this climate change is being tackled step by step, just like we have a saying that a drop of water can make an ocean. So a, a, a step by step action or policy yeah. that can be taken to um, curb out or arrest and, you know, stop this climate change, mitigate, uh, yeah, mitigate this climate change, yeah. will really go a long way. And of course, it is not something that you do and it's, it's, it's just for the now. It's for both a future purpose and it will serve for generations to come. You see people that will keep living, they will see that ah, this thing has actually helped us. Yeah. Okay, because it's not, it's not enough for, for the country to keep living in that kind of disastrous environment. A lot of quick actions need to be taken. Indeed, um, you made a fair point there, and I think um, that's what we'll continue as the program continues. But we'll take a quick break now so we can hear from our expert uh, talking about a climate change advocate, a journalist. Uh, he'll be joining us from the United Kingdom via um, a virtual call. He's Hollins Esagba, and uh, that will be right after this break. Stay with us. Let's face it, our world today experiences numerous challenges. And guess what? Our community isn't off the hook either. Most of the world issues are either not talked about enough or never talked about at all. But here on Timeline, we've got you covered. We dive deep into issues that affect us every day, leaving behind footprints of wisdom, knowledge, and solutions. Think of it like a roadmap that keeps you on the track for success. So buckle up. Because in this new season of Timeline, we're taking another trip through the past, the present, and navigate into a more promising future. Again, we're talking solutions, people. And let's make one thing clear. This is not your average blah, blah, blah combo. This is real talk with a side of inspiration and a sprinkle of wow. I never thought about it like that. I'm your host on this impactful ride. Together, we'll tackle the tough stuff, laugh a little, and find ourselves on the path positive change. So what are you waiting for? This is two of Timeline. We'll be loaded. Let's get started. Hop in and let's drive straight into the hearts of issues shaping our world. Let's go. Oh, one more thing. Hit that subscribe button and let's take this ride together. Every day, Amazing stories of hope and tenacity unfold across the globe. On Hued Hour, we dive into these inspiring tales and discuss the vital work being done in the humanitarian and development space. Humanity has never faced a shortage of challenges, yet we rise stronger through teamwork and determination. Though these remedies are often underreported, 
On Hewed Hour, we advocate sustainable solutions. We bring you the latest and most impactful news on how lives are being changed. We engage with young change makers and experts who provide valuable insights into relief efforts and the challenges faced by local communities through a global perspective. Join us every Wednesday by 8 a.m. on Hued Network's YouTube channel as we embark on this journey of positive change. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is still Hued Hour on Hued Network. We've been talking about climate change and climate action. Right now, we're being joined uh, virtually from the UK by a climate change advocate and a climate for health ambassador, Mr. Hollins Esiagba. Uh, good day. Uh, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome, Thanks Mr. for coming. Collins. All right. So let's um, go straight into it. Um, we've been talking a lot about climate change uh, earlier in the program and all of that. I wonder if you can start us in with the reality of things, uh, very clear examples of things that are happening. So that it doesn't seem as though, uh, as they say, speaking a lot of English and there's no um, on the ground assessment of things. So let us in on that, the situation of things that are 2024, before we delve further into other issues. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, it is not um, it is not a hoax. It is not um, a scam that climate change is real. Um, over the past, you know, few months, there have been several records of climate change events. You know, even in the U.S., where we've had of tornadoes and so many other things, we looked at um, droughts and different forms of. Um, of um of a flood and flash floods in different areas, even in Africa, you know, some of the very vulnerable places in the world affected by climate change. Um, it is what we've seen recently as you know the new <laughs> normal because mm. um you see it affecting you know a cross section of areas in human life. We're looking at um from agriculture, which talks about food, to um, electricity supply to education and so many other things, even this is spread in communities. So at the end of the day, you're seeing that climate change affects not just, you know, um, those perpetuating, you know, this thing and, you know, emitting much fossil fuel and then um, carbon, but even the countries doing almost nothing, you know, to mm. what's in the case. So we're looking at um, a growing um, level of impact, you know, from last year, several deaths were recorded, um, they were, devastating impacts on life and property, you know, farmlands. And even this year, it's been something else, you know, several communities in Africa, from the Horn of Africa to the other regions have recorded different impacts of climate change which they are currently dealing with. And I believe it's about time for um, both government and local partners to actually step up and do the need for to face the reality. All right, um, thank you so much. I would like to ask you, um, concerning the global warming, can you explain, lay more emphasis on that? Okay, so global warming is, um, can be explained to be an increase in, you know, you know, temperature over time in a particular place, increasing temperature, increasing the heating levels of different areas. We're looking at um, very high heating points and um, extreme heat in some areas. We're looking at places that um, naturally that should be cooling, actually heating up. And this, in other words, is affecting different areas of their livelihood. We're looking at global warming as a um, result of um, the warming of the planet. This is also as a result of the emission of um, increased greenhouse effects, which trap heat in the atmosphere. Naturally, um, the ozone layer is supposed to protect the Earth's surface from the impact of ultraviolet ray A and B, which actually end up affecting, you know, livelihood from plants to animals, including, you know, including human beings. And at the end of the day, we're looking at um, this increase emissions that are both natural and man-made 
tend to go up there and rather than allow this you know usual greenhouse effects are you know cool things but when there's an increase in them they get to trap the heat at the atmosphere and at the end of the day they get to deplete the ozone layer which help to protect the earth's surface at the end of the day we have heating you know temperatures naturally the um temperature of things should actually get things work in a moderate level where you know your normal you know season times and season you know when it should be cold you know when it should be hot we have okay this time is Hamatan, you know as we usually say in nigeria this is Hamatan period this is rainy season but now you can see the rainy season extend longer than usual you can see the Hamatan yeah. season extend longer than usual you can see these things on the extreme level which are in different levels results of our man-made activities and natural activities all right, fair enough. Um, in the course of um, our conversation, you've mentioned, you know, sometimes man-made or natural. You also mentioned how some regions are suffering from things, even though they might not be the primary um, causes or the primary uh, ones who are affecting it. So let's talk about causes. So people start to know. Are there things that people like you and I, regular persons on the streets, are doing that's, uh, you know, um, adding to climate change? Are there things that corporations countries. Um, so let us really know what the causes are uh, before we can delve further into more issues like solutions and, and thereabouts. Okay, thank you. To start with, um, naturally, we have rainfall and many other things. We have animals living their lives. We have trees, yeah. you know, taking in, you know, carbon dioxide and giving out oxygen, which we humans depend on and other animals depend on. Plants give, we receive, we give, plants receive, okay? And while this is on, there are several other things that, you know, are the norms as regards human life. Since the industrial um, 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 time in the 1800s, that is when our eyes became more open to industrialization, we started in manufacturing and then naturally the usual emission of carbon dioxide is at the moderate level. There are natural greenhouse effects, you know, and natural um, emission of, you know, greenhouse gases from methane to, um, you know, CO2 and the rest of them. These were natural processes, but since the activities of industrialization and other increased man-made activities, we have these emissions at an increased rate, which is actually threatening because if the planet is supposed to, you know, um, heat by a certain percentage, let's say at, uh, let's say minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, or let's say by one degree Celsius, because of the rate of these emissions, because of the rate of our activities, it becomes even worse. Now we have um, animals, you know, um, they are, Plants and animals decomposition, which actually emit CMH4 and actually part of greenhouse gases that at the end of into the atmosphere, you know, trap more heat, end up depleting the ozone layer. We have other different, you know, areas that are actually linked to this. Then we have the man-made areas as um, companies and governments become more innovative and they want to build in more infrastructure, they want to manufacture things, they want to innovate. Um, all of these things, the processes by which all of these things go through actually functions and activities that lead to the emissions of greenhouse gases. One of the most important one is that of um, the emission of fossil fuel from um, mining and um, um, oil and gas drilling. We see the um, the dissipation and um, emission of um, um, CO2, CH from the rest of them using chimneys and several other areas. Some of these companies, you know, um, actually have these properties of polluting even water life, and at the end of the day. Fishers can, you know, they can fish, fishermen can fish, people can go on with their livelihood, you know, depending on what they are um, living on. Okay, so different areas are actually where we come in. Um, but I like to actually put it straight that when you talk about climate change and the um, devastating impacts that have been felt in different parts of the world, some of them are a result of, yes, climate change, while others are a result of our practices from um, blocking gutters, you're looking at um, large floods in areas where at the end of the day, dams are unable to you know, you know, know, function well due to poor maintenance. We're looking at areas where even the water of um, dams are drying up because of atmospheric condition and the overheating. So there's less water to actually produce electricity. You're looking at 
power supply. You're looking at areas where um, human beings on their own side, you know, we sabotage things and different you know, activities of humans get to affect climate change and lead to where we are today. Poor maintenance and so many other things, the unwillingness of government to, you know, partner with agencies and ensure that some of these structures we build actually give rise and accommodate what we're looking at to curtail the impact of climate change as we move forward. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to know what are those strategies or policies that governments, international organizations are doing to make sure that this climate change is being reduced or, you know, being uh, arrested or eradicated? Thank you. Because climate change involves me and it involves you, it involves the vulnerable and non-vulnerable countries. It means we all have to work together. We have to see how we can approach climate change impacts from our own local content point of view. We have to look at it from our own islands. In, in that regard, it means we must look at how it affects us and how we can respond to it. For example, the current um, El Nino affecting some parts of South you know, Africa, um, South African countries are actually a function of, you know, drought, a function of, you know, heavy rainfall and, and flooding. So you see that it's it's different from time to time. So if you're studying and want to have an approach to it, you're looking at having um, different solutions tied to different problems. For example, having artificial irrigation systems to cope with the lack of watering, you know, for plants, which has been a function of, which has been um, a function of um, farming and reduced production of farm produce is another way. Um, we're looking at having communities work together to see that there is improved education about the kind of seeds to, to plant because some plants actually some seedlings actually um um in the arid region actually resistant to you know the climate change and the lack of you know water so you might decide okay fine since we've been producing maize which has been a common thing and people depend on it as a form of nutrition can we switch to other forms of grains like beans which may be more resistant to the high temperature and lack of water are we looking at areas where we know that um we have to leverage meteorological data and science to ensure that we can have early warnings to climate disasters. We looked at um, the earthquake and at several places, um, earthquake at Morocco last year, we looked at um, the flood in, in Libya. And we saw how people had to look at the situation and say, okay, this was a function of the failure of data and proper analysis and forecasting. We're looking at partnership, Africa, you know, and other parts of the world have to partner more. But looking at Africa, we know that the investment is low. Um, last year, a total of um, over $100 billion were released for climate funding to combat climate change and perhaps support clean energy. But at the end of the day, about two point something billion was the only thing released to Africa and we are the most vulnerable. So we're looking at more investment, we're looking at carbon taxing, we're looking at trying to see that countries can be more involved and, and active in the agreements they've signed from the Paris Agreement to the several COP20s they've had. So we're looking at more internationality. Another important, you know, so to this is the action of partnering and collaborating. Countries can collaborate between one another. If we can send, you know, petroleum products from one region to another region. It simply means we can also transport water from one region to another region. Within different continents, this can be done. So there are a lot of a lot of ways you can look at recycling. You can see countries increasing, you know, the strategies they have for um, carbon, you know, taxing and increasing the rate at which companies get more involved with the fallout from carbon emissions. You can also look at how some other con um, countries and companies have actually worked with recycling their emissions. So rather than emitting these, you know, gases into the atmosphere, they have a channel that recycles these things back in. They're making different products and even having services they can deliver with them to actually reduce the rate of waste. You see um, restrictions and um, and then policies that can be signed to ensure that pollution and so many other things do not continue. So there was a lot, a lot, especially in education, especially ensure that there is no gap between genders when you look at this crisis. There's a lot we can do as a country, as a continent, and as a world 
in general. All right, fair enough. Um, a part of what we're doing now, I guess, is um, the awareness we're talking about. Um, you mentioned just now trying to get farmers to understand seeds perhaps are more um, resilient to climate change and all of that. And I, I try to imagine perhaps someone who's practicing subsistence farming, whose family has, you know, been into a certain uh, crop for years, you know, and trying to explain to them why, you know, they might need to change things and all of that. So my question now pertains to the awareness to communities. Uh, uh, the other day I heard a, a climate um, uh, action um, advocate who, who pointed out that some of the, the things we are seeing, like the COP, the COPs, you know, COP28, COP27, COP25, and so on, that what we normally see, uh, sorry, pardon me, the ones that have already come, not the ones yet to come, um, that we see a lot of experts there, but not so many frontline leaders on climate change, as they say, which is people who are directly affected. So my question is, how does this message translate to them? What challenges are encountered when trying to explain to people who are predominantly victims of this uh, phenomenon? You mentioned that Africa got you know, a certain amount of money compared to the total amount that was released, despite us uh, being the ones affected. So how does the message go across to those at the grassroots level and those who are facing this thing? How do we explain to them, especially with people claiming that climate change is a hoax and is, uh, is some sort of uh, scam? Okay, thank you very much. I think looking at that particular question, you must have to look at the leadership. You need to look at, you know, the leadership you're looking at at the first place. If you're looking at a leadership anywhere in the world, yeah. Malaysia, Nigeria, or anywhere, it has to do with the intentionality and the purpose. If the leadership in question is saying, okay, fine, this is a problem, I will need to deal with it, you will see it in the actions. When you're going for such summits and, and conferences, you're looking at people who can go there and not just represent the fact that the, the, the country was represented, but the fact that someone who has had a direct, you know, has felt a direct impact of these things, have seen firsthand what this is doing. Um, you're looking at increasing rates of malnutrition in several parts of you know um, East Africa. This you can't bring in someone who has no idea about this or, or just reads you know, on on the paper or see the figures or gets the data and that's it. You need to have people who have seen firsthand and that can relate, can give you firsthand experience, can give you details of these things and tell you that, oh, it's not just what you see on the paper. It's not just what you see on the news. You go there, see that houses are flooded, see that people cannot feed, see that kids cannot go to school. When you're giving people who have had firsthand experience about these things an opportunity to represent their communities, they are more um, I, won't, I don't want to use the word um, more emotional, but they can actually speak to the data, they can relate to it, they can say, okay, this strategy would not work. This strategy would work. This area has a particular level, um, have, has people with a particular level of education, they are not so educated. This is the strategy I feel we can use to engage them that they can get you know, the, the, the knowledge firsthand. This is the way I think we could actually support communities. I, when this person is speaking, when this group of people are speaking, they're speaking from experience, they're speaking of what can work and what cannot work. Mm. Same thing with um, the level of um, government interference. If government wants to be really involved and not just say, okay, um, some communities are suffering um, El Nino, some communities are some, um, 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 suffering um, um, heat waves, people, uh, several people have died from... When they're speaking, they're speaking and saying, okay, this is what has happened. This is what we are doing. I think you can help. I believe um, the Western world doesn't, it's true that the funding is available, but not so, so available because a lot is needed. But of the funding available, the Western world, I believe, want to see that Africans are not just, okay, the African regions are not just saying, oh, we are the most vulnerable, we are the ones suffering the most, we are the ones least funded. What are we doing? What are the homegrown strategies we're taking? Are we partnering with fellow, you know, our, our fellow, you know, African countries and say, okay, this is where we can help you. How can you help us? If we keep waiting for the support from the West and other areas, we may never go forward. But I think a way to start is by saying, this is where we are right now. 
it's important because if you don't see climate change impacts or the crisis happening as important, you never take it serious. So it's, it's, it's time to, it's true that several of these countries in different regions have, you know, declared a state of emergency based on the climate, you know, crisis going on at the moment, but that's not enough. We have to look at collaboration. We have to look at looking at people who can provide solutions from the problem and not just from anywhere else. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So what are those individual, uh, will I say, policies or strategies that you as an advocate that you have put in place to make sure that at least we, we come out of the whole climate change issue? Okay, as a person, um, in, in the past three to four years, I have um, represented several um, countries in model summits where we talk about climate change, we've talked about um, adopting the use of um, gen genetically modified seedlings, like we earlier mentioned, seedlings that are um, highly resilient to the impacts of climate change um, and, and global warming. We've I've, I've published several you know, articles about you know what people are doing, the crisis themselves, and then how people are actually adapting to these changes. I've also talked about several ways that we can move forward. I would really adopt um, the, the use of um, more intensive education and awareness. If we speak more about climate change, people are going to do more about climate change, sincerely. If um, the people in the grassroots decide to start engaging the communities, engage you know stakeholders and say these are the problems it's true that you're living on the highlands and you may not be affected by may not be affected by some of these things but this is where we are where we are right now this is what we are going through this is how we think you can help us i think we need to start um pushing in more education um training of farmers helping them understand that oh these strategies we've been using to you know grow our crops for the last 10 years the last 20 years at this time at this rate of global warming and climate change crisis it may not work we have to improvise we need to innovate we need to look at ways we can teach them how to innovate these people are busy trying to you know farm to provide food for their communities and their families they won't have them to start studying so they don't have access to internet or access to power power supply so it's not the duty of stakeholders it's not the duty of um non-governmental organizations and government organizations including you know the un and several other wonderful um agencies doing great work to become more intentional to engage more with these communities not just to get data and put on the internet and let everybody know this was happening what are you doing how can we work with these communities how can we you know engage with other people go there do some things come back see the results analyze innovate them see how we can do better and go back i think one of the things we, we should not forget to mention here is the fact that leadership is so important as leaders there is a duty there is a responsibility there is an accountability factor to every leader that is dealing with climate change one area or the other don't don't you I, I think it's a common thing where we hear leaders just say okay this is what's going on and it's it's a, a result of what someone has said and just say, oh, sir, these are the data, or oh, man, these are the information, this is what we know. Going there, seeing firsthand, seeing how well ministries are working to ensure that from the education to technology to transportation, every sector is actually having a very key part of, of, of climate change mitigation and adaptation in their plan. Um, We've seen that recently Africa's you know, GDP, um, a particular increase in percentage, about 2 to 3%, is now spent on climate change mitigation adaptation. We can see that all of these are effort, but there is so much we can still do. And I believe if we work together, we are going to achieve more. Fair enough, indeed. Uh, those are inspiring words there. And um, I think it's a very clear outline to the plan ahead. Um, so, my question now is uh, to try and make this more personal, to put it on a more um, local level. I think when we talk about climate change, people think it's such a global phenomenon, something so wide and broad that doesn't concern individuals. So that's the question I want to, um, to get, now, get to now. On an individual level, the average person out there, a banker, a teacher, a journalist like myself, living their daily lives, what can we be doing uh, in order to you know, do our own part. Because um, like I've heard from other experts, they speak about the difference between 
climate mitigation or climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Adaptation is uh, where you, you know, sort of just rule with the punches and mitigation are sustainable, yeah, long-lasting yeah. effects, yes. So yeah. about that, as an average person, what do you say to maybe those watching right now, to you and I and all of that, what are those little things that we can be doing that shows that all that, you know, is going towards climate change mitigation? Can we do anything on an individual level? Okay, yes, we can do a lot. On an individual level, um, one of the things like we've discussed uh, the, you know, the result of, you know, climate change um, is the growing temperature or the abnormal, you know, increase and decrease in, in the temperature rates. And one of the ways we try to um, cool our environment is by, you know, using ACs, you want to use um, um, particular technology to, you know, dry our clothes faster. I want to use some particular kind of fertilizers. We're doing, trying to do so many, many things. Um, trying to use a particular kind of bulbs. Now, considering climate change and the fact that the more energy, because all of this, all of this came from the industrial age where we're trying to, industrial revolution, where we're trying to innovate and, in, innovate and get you know, better you know, energy levels. So if we can reduce our energy usage, we can actually conserve a lot of things. We can conserve water usage, we can conserve energy usage, anything you're not using, turn it off okay because at the end of the day for example in some of um, the countries right now where and you know is actually you know very, very um, um pronounced we are seeing them that they can not even generate enough electricity because the, the dam is actually dry to some extent yeah. to some levels so it means if we try and ensure that we don't use so much we can conserve and ensure that it's enough to go around if we ensure that our disposal of waste is actually in a very manageable manner such that they are recyclable we use recyclable products we can actually ensure that more materials are you know are reused rather than be produced okay so we have less waste but, um even the way we dispose our waste you know sewages and so many other things having to adopt very very practicable things and things that actually do not further cause more problems for us there are communities where people dispose their you know their their their, their sewages in the sea you're looking at I, I think when people look at climate change, they always say oh it's about the sun it's about rainfall and that's it climate change has also affected the health of people okay in the very very serious and deadly manner people suffering from different diseases from cancer to skin bones and many other things we can't even mention because of emission because of pollution because of the kind of water they drink so the cases of diarrhea and um, um, cholera we hear um, in different parts of the world are not always a function of just climate change but a function of how we have responded to climate change some of us till date dispose you know, um, um, our sewage is in water bodies, killing, you know, life in the water and affecting, you know, people living in surroundings. So all of these practices are things that have in the past and the present and in the future affect and will affect the way we live. So I feel some of these things are things that we can do. We can check and say, okay, fine. Actually, this really affects me. There are things that I can do differently um, from reducing uh energy consumption we can actually try and engage people more we can talk about it we get a subject of discussion in places um i think one of the ways we can really push you know things a common um, um crisis has been flawed that has displaced thousands you know killed thousands destroyed lives and properties you know properties and infrastructure works billion and millions of of of, of naira depending on which country you're based these are things that can actually be avoided if starting with the human means if we say okay fine there is a high land there is a low land government can actually do some things working with individuals and say okay fine let's have an evacuation let's see how we can do more to ensure that people who are actually on these particular levels that are always affected by floods are not at this place when the floods come and this can only happen where we are working together. We are actually raising our voice, bringing our voices together and reaching out to the right persons. I think it's also an important thing if we decide to um, take up the initiative and say, okay, fine, what can we do from our own point of view? How can we, how can we 
partner with the government. Uh, we know governments are doing a lot, but how can we do more? How can we work with different agencies? As a person, how can I tell my family? How can I tell my community? How can those in my street know that climate change is real? The fact that we have food to eat here and our plants are doing well doesn't mean someone in some other part of this same country okay, are enjoying the same thing. So understanding that we are all involved and the fact that climate change crisis is in one place and not here doesn't mean it isn't going to get here at some point. So acting now saves us better. Okay, yeah, that's a very good um, word there. Acting now will save us better. Okay, so let's move down to the futuristic um, outlook for it. Um, what are those projections that we should look out for uh, based on the climate change mitigation? Okay, um, right now, um, countries, you know, agencies and um, government organizations are working towards net zero in 2030. However, we are seeing that um, it's maybe possible, it may not be possible. Some are trying to push the agenda to 20, 2050 because looking at the way things are going, we are seeing that um, with the time available, we might be pushing to higher temperature rise up to um, an additional two degrees Celsius before the next 10 years, you know, elapses. So people are looking at ways we can further try to work on this. Um, an example of this approach is some of the, you know, deals that were signed in um, the, you know, several summits that have been had. Even the last UN summits, there were discussions that were made and people were saying, okay, there is um, a function that has to be companies, countries working together to say, okay, this is how we can move forward, giving each other, you know, targets, seeing how we can place several targets on the things, on the kind of productions we have, on the way we do our businesses, on the way we, you know, um, build connections between countries to ensure that our level of, you know, um, emissions reduces. A way, you know, countries are actually trying to handle this is to ensure that um, some of the targets they've given themselves, you know, to cut, um, you know, carbonization and emissions is actually more ambitious and not, you know, um, just for the records or for the paper. So I think one of the ways people are doing this is to see how in that you can work together to achieve the sustainable goal of climate change in the nearest future. We are um, looking at things, we are um, we're looking at things, we are re-evaluating the strategies we have. We see um, companies and countries working together, both governments and non-governments, I mean to say, are working together to see how, okay, the policies work. We're saying, okay, if we are emitting so much carbon, um, this is the tax we have to pay. We are saying, okay, fine, if um, you're, you're producing a service or you're manufacturing the product or service, and this is the particular emissions you know, you're putting out there. How can you reduce it? How much are you going to pay? Um, how many thorns do you have to you know, release per year? So all of these strategies are ways that countries and companies are saying, okay, fine, let's try and see how we can do this. Although people, um, the records are out there that um, some countries are not taking more ambitious, they're not taking ambitious you know, targets because some of them emit more, some of them emit less. You see that some countries that are highly, you know, um, mechanized and there's a lot of factories, you know, a lot of emissions going on. People expect that they're actually taking, you know, more challenge, taking more targets because if you check and look at this holistically, some of them are not really affected by, you know, the impact of climate change. It is the vulnerable countries that actually suffer these things more. And so we are saying, let's come back to the table. Let's see how we can take in more, uh, take in more responsibilities. Let's see how we can fund more projects that involves, you know, our steps towards net zero. These things are actually possible. It's just that if we don't work together, if we don't work with actionable targets, if we don't work with intentionality, if we don't work with the reality that people are actually losing their lives, you know, day after day, you know, month after month from the impact of climate change, we would not actually be more intentional. We wouldn't be actually active and very involved in these things. Another thing is the way the United Nations have been going about this and the United Nations climate. It speaks to the fact that um, we are actually on a good path because we have you know, an agency, we have a body that is unifying this effort that is saying, okay, this is how far we've gone. This is how well we should go. This project is feasible. This project may not be so feasible. We may need to increase the time plan for this. We have um, agencies working on different levels to ensure that, oh, they are checking, they are following up on different, you know, 
um, um, decisions that have been made, different plans that have been placed down. Um, the Paris Agreement, there were several things that were signed, there were several agreements that were signed. But as you know, not every country, not everyone is you know, dealing with it. And of course, we can't forget to mention that um, the fact that the wars in the Middle East, um, you know, that of Sudan, that of Ukraine and um, Russia, all of these have, in one way or the other, affected food production, affect energy yes. production, and there is a pressure on different economies. So because they have to find a way to get more, you know, um, um, energy produced from um, not just food oil, but the refining process to get PMS, you know, the DPK, AG on the rest of them, these processes are now more pressurized. They are now right. running on a faster pace because production has to be missed. So there's a lot going on. And I think right. as time goes on, we keep meeting, we kept seeing how we can unify our efforts, know where we are, assess how we are moving forward and make good progress. All right, thank you so much. Um, you've said it all already, uh, and we've run out of time at this moment. Um, just to know that to, um, tomorrow is Climate Action Day, and uh, we'll be seeing a lot of people planting trees and uh, doing a lot. Hopefully it goes more than that. But thank you so much uh, for being on the program, and um, uh, we'll do well to take uh, into account a lot of things you've said and also disseminated further. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Uh, now uh, we end uh, this segment of the program. We've been speaking with Hollins Esagba. He is a climate change advocate and a journalist. And uh, we've been talking on climate change and the aspects on how to mitigate it and so on and so forth. We hope you've learned one or two. Uh, we'll go on a quick break now when we return. We hear from the verified voices. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, this is our Verified Voices segment where we take a look at what the key stakeholders on the matter at hand has, are saying on the issue. Today's topic is climate change. So let's see what the stakeholders are saying on climate change. Uh, the first one there is from the UN um, Climate Change. We have climate action is good for business. An alliance of 131 companies, and it says there in between that... Uh, have cut emissions by 10%, equivalent of the annual emission of France, while growing revenues by 18%. The bolder government climate policies, the better for business and economies. That's interesting there. It says that just by cutting emissions by 10%, they have grown revenues by 18%. And I think this is what people in business and entrepreneurs love to hear, that Yes, climate action is going to help, you know, save the world, but also it's going to save them money and help them. So um, it's not the most altruistic reason to key into climate action, but it is a valid reason yeah. for many to key in. You're very correct. Okay, yeah. let's quickly move to the next um, uh, verified voice that we have. Okay, still from United Nations, we can see uh, climate change is making hurricanes more powerful and dangerous. Mm. Storm surges are higher due to sea level rise caused by climate change. Higher temperatures also mean heavier rain and flooding during storms. We must hashtag act now and take hashtag climate action. And of course, we are still seeing in the pictorial representation there, climate change is hitting the, the oceans, which makes hurricanes more dangerous. This was when I talked about uh, the global warming. Yeah. Uh, the, the higher the heat coming from this um, equipment and these facilities, yeah. the, the, the more dangerous we are exposed to climate change and its, uh, will I say, negatives that comes with, with it. it. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, quickly, let's move on to the next um, uh, verified voice there. And now we have from UNDP Climate. With the current climate commitments, the world is on track to be 2.7 degrees Celsius warmer within this century. This would cause massive and permanent damage to our planet. Next round of climate plans is a chance for countries to renew their commitment to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it says there in the pictorial representation, every fraction of a degree of warming matters. Indeed, um, Perhaps in our daily lives, we might not see how important it is for temperature to rise by little 
But when it comes to the earth, those little temperatures lead to glaciers melting, leads to flooding, leads to earthquakes, and so on and so forth. So we should take it seriously as much as possible. Yeah, of course, we should take it serious. All right, let's quickly move to the last um, news uh, verified voice we have. Okay, this is coming from the World Bank Climate. So it says, the world is expected to face a 40% shortfall between demand and supply of water by 2030, with 10% of the global population already living in areas of critical water stress. We must protect these resources and hashtag scale up finance for water. And also in that same pictorial representation there, we can see a, uh, a coming down or a depreciation of water, the arrow showing that the world will face a 40% shortfall between demand and supply of water by 2030. And of course, we see 10% of the world's population is already living in water-stressed countries. And of course, finally, we see climate change is amplifying water challenges with nine out of 10 natural disasters involving water. Well, Amadine, it's mm -hmm. just clearly obvious that water is looking like it's going into extinction. <laughs> <laughs> On a very low scale, but still, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it sounds funny, but it's very serious yeah. indeed. Uh, especially when people speak from privilege, they have access to a lot of water, they don't know that people are suffering. So of uh, these are what the verified voices are saying. They know best and they have given their advice on how things should go. And that's how we end the program for today. We've been talking about climate change and it's been an interesting one and we've been uh, trying to delve deep into what we need to do, what governments should be doing, what organizations should be doing, what you and I should be doing. I hope you learned a lot from this. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Once again, we'll be joined uh, on Cued Hour on Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. to bring you more into the humanitarian and development sector. I am Amadi Nobewe. See you next time. And I am John Eze. Do take care of yourself. Bye.